Hi, folks, and welcome back to another episode of North American Deer Talk. This is Josh Newton. I hope everyone is doing well on this fine day. It is March 25th, 70 degrees here in north central Pennsylvania. I don't know what to do with myself. It is awfully nice outside. Uh, we had a big rainstorm uh, push in last night and get everything nice and and saturated but uh it's drying out real quick and and uh certainly spring is in the air i am uh, doing a live recording of the show here and we'll get that posted up on our our youtube channel so if you're uh if you're listening to the podcast and you'd like to uh sit there and watch a uh, a youtube show you can do that and uh we, we appreciate it. Just make sure when you go over there uh, to the Servant Solutions YouTube page uh, that you subscribe and, uh, and like those videos. It, it helps get the reach out. Uh, we have started a North American Deer Talk Facebook group. So if you just uh, punch into the search on your, on your Facebook, North American Deer Talk, it'll come up. Go ahead and uh, uh, request to get in that group and... I will. Uh, I'll get you in there. It's a, just a place to keep uh, tabs on the show. Um, I am gonna hopefully continue to use that to, you know, drum up some interviews and uh, develop some content. You know, as I <clears throat> as I do these these shows, which I really enjoy doing and and sharing, you know, time with with all of you. Um, it, it is it is challenging to, to you know develop. Uh, show ideas and show thoughts uh, and then you know when I'm doing them by myself uh, get on get on this uh, microphone sitting in front of me and just you know riff for for a half hour or an hour um, about a topic um, but I guess with that said I, I've been thinking about how how we uh, you know kind of go through this day-to-day um, things that we do on the farm and just in conversations that we're starting to have with our clients here at Servant Solutions. Um, and for those of you that don't know, uh, Servant Solutions is a, a health management platform. And we've just developed some pretty, I think they're basic at this point, but um, kind of pretty basic pillars or tenets of, of health management and specifically in white-tailed deer, but also uh, we have folks that uh, have elk and mule deer as well. And they're, they're practicing these, these things that we talk about and you'll, you'll hear me, you'll hear me talk about those, um, you know, almost every show just, uh, because we think that the health of these animals is, is really important. Um, and it's, it's critical to be successful because your, your animals are your inventory and that inventory is your cash. And if you start losing fawns, um, because we know that they're most susceptible to bacteria and sickness, etc. Um, it, it just it it erodes that bottom line really quick. So it's really really important to get those swans, you know, to you know goal, you know the goal is weaning, and then you know to to a year old, and then you know once they're a, once they're a year old and they get to that year and a half old stage, um, they are much 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 more self-sufficient so we talk about all sorts of things to keep these guys alive and and make them perform so in these conversations that i've been having uh with folks we talk about um you know preparation of of what we do before the fawns come Uh, but today i want to talk about when the fawns arrive things to look at um, some of the challenges that arise that you deal with and lay that out on a, on a, a timeline basis and how we go about things. So you've heard, if you've, if you've talked to other people, um, you've heard you know people say, hey, everybody's got a different way of doing things. And that's very true. So these are based off of my experiences, uh, the things that I've, I've found uh, over you know 20, 20 plus years of, of raising deer that work really well and I think that are, are, are universal uh, to most places and, and as I've uh, shared these you know techniques, strategies, things, observations 
uh, with other people, and then they've uh, potentially implemented some of the suggestions that we've made in, in the conversations that we have with them, um, it really um, it validates a lot of, of my thoughts on, on these particular issues. So um, I guess we'll just we'll jump in. And, um, you know, one of the things I'll start by saying um, we have a very simplistic approach to what we do with our fawns when they're born. And that is based off of all the things that we do prior to them being born. There's really two, there's two key components. Um, one is our vaccine program. I, I was um, pretty anti-vaccine for, for a long time. And uh, I got my tail kicked one year with fawn losses. And I said, there's, there's got to be a better way. So I started researching um, what that you know, what that meant in other animal industries, because there's, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, really what I considered quality data uh, to look at in uh, the deer world. So I have had many conversations with my veterinarian, who, by the way, is the best. That's Dr. Uh, Rachel Weiss here in, in Pennsylvania. And anybody that knows her, um, you know, hat, hat tip to, to her on that you know everybody says the same thing she's she's awesome so um, she's helped me with this process a bunch and and we've worked through the different things but you know there was nothing really standardized and and you know we we work on that here at Servant Solutions on a daily basis trying to um, come up with you know neat ways to to present this information and kind of lock it into the the history books um, one of them being this this podcast where you know you and I get to spend a little time together and, and chat about about deer and you know various management things so um you know there there I, I came to this place where i was just like this there has to be a different way you know this this um what what is what is vaccinating animals and and beef cows and sheep and goats etc what does that what does that mean what does it do and we we started to develop these these vaccines and so that's that's one component, right? Um, the PV two and the EV one; those are our, our two vaccines, and they cover different things. We're not going to get into the specific uh, specifics of that uh, here today, but those are the two vaccines we use, and we spend as much time as we need to to make sure that all the animals on the farm are vaccinated on a regular basis, multiple times a year. Okay. The second thing is um, pen density. So this would be the amount of animals that you have on any given space. And this is the most important thing when it comes to raising white-tailed deer. There is just no doubt in my mind that the less animals you have on a, a given piece of ground, the less problems you have. And that when I say less problems, yeah, we're talking about sickness, and that's an easy way to, to kind of quantify um, that, that this is meaningful and this works. But this is, this is something bigger. So when I, when I look at this and I say, um, and I'm just going to use small kind of rough figures so we can, we can uh, talk through this. If I have four one-acre pens for my does, and, you know, I have um, 40 does. I'm going to be putting 10 does in each one of those pens. Now, that may work for a year or two or a couple. Eventually, it's going to catch up with you um, because that's just way too many deer. Now, 10 does might be fine in there by themselves. But when those 10 does turn into, you know, 16 to 20 fawns, you got 30 deer in there. Well, that's not okay. But what we recommend is somewhere between four and six adult does per acre. Now, 
when you're running the tendos with the fawns, there's a lot of management that has to go on to make that a success. And you you probably can make it a success short term. Long term, I don't think that's possible. Um, and and people have different standards for what success is, and we can we can kind of touch on that. But you know those those ten does. There's going to be some sickness. There's going to be some additional soil improvements. There's going to be just stress. You you can you can think about all the things that uh, you as the operator need to to you know put into that pen and those deer um, to make that quote unquote a success and then what those deer give you in return and if you're looking at dollars and cents there's a lot of dollars that have to go into that pen to keep everybody i use this term loosely healthy i will call it alive um and then you know the dollars that you eventually get out when you're you're selling you know bucks fawns etc cetera, etc cetera. so um as i as i drop my numbers down and i really like the four deer per acre five five deer per acre that seems fine and these are adult animals i'm not talking about fawns um and i think i think for bucks that number is is fine too um when you're looking in that four to five range there's nearly no inputs you feed them you keep an eye on them that's it you don't have to treat sick animals now this is in combination with the vaccine this is again from my experience the amount of soil improvements that you need to do is far less there's no wormer deer don't get parasites you know you can go we're we're on uh I just I just uh, ran uh, some fawns and and vaccinated uh, here. I did I guess I did buck fawns last uh, last weekend. I gave them some wormer. I gave them some injectable wormer. They hadn't been wormed, um, you know, since weaning. And those those bucks they won't be wormed again, most likely, um, ever. We'll keep them till they're three. And they'll they'll be fine. We just try not to overcrowd them. When you overcrowd them, everything goes wrong. So, you know, wormer has a has a cost. Now somebody would say, well, you know, if you're getting whatever four thousand bucks for a for a deer, you know, for a buck when you sell it to the to the ranch for stocking, um, you know, that four thousand dollars gets you a lot of those inputs. It does. I wonder how many of those bucks extra you have to raise. So, can we come, I mean, if you want to talk, I don't want to get sidetracked, but I'm going to. I always do. When you talk buck management, you know, you start putting a bunch of rowdy teenagers in a in a pen packed up together, they're going to do some damage. Um, so, anyway, back to, the, back to the does. The inputs on those four to five adults per acre are super super low and um, I think that that for me just again purely from a management side of things and a performance side of things and what we see as far as stress goes and all that stuff all those things are at the bare bare minimum I think that's great and I want to manage my farm in that manner that requires me to do the least amount of work with the least amount of input dollars into that with the best animals and the best returns possible. So those are the two tenants we're talking about. And that's the place at which I come from this conversation and what I'm about to talk about. So we'll, we'll walk through, um, the, the life cycle of the fawn uh, from the day it's born and we'll, we'll take it up to maybe weaning time or something like that. So there's a couple, there's really, I think, uh, one or two things that you need to be prepared for, right? 
and have a, a really a mindset um, for, and that is the um, treatment of any animals that do get sick, because animals do get sick, regardless of you have you know one animal on an acre, um, and you have every vaccine that you can think of going into them. Animals do do still get sick. That happens. Um, so being able to to have you know treatments options available is important. Uh, the next thing is for you to be prepared to do diagnostics to come up with long-term preventable solutions. And this, we find this true with many of our our new uh, new clients or or um, folks that are just getting started on our vaccine program, maybe have never been on a vaccine program, or just they've vaccinated not at a, a consistent rate or you know, applied some of these other um, management things that we've been talking about. So um, having your diagnostic kits ready to go is important when you do encounter a problem. So what, is, what does that consist of? Well, it's pretty basic. Um, you need a cooler and gel packs. The gel packs need to be frozen, ready to go. And then just a small box cooler. Um, gonna say maybe I had something here that I could show the folks in the video but you know small cube uh, eight by eight by seven something like that and if you've gotten vaccine from us the coolers that we send um, they would work well so you have you have your your cooler so you can send uh, whatever diagnostic material you need um, culture swabs so for a long time we we didn't I didn't use culture swabs I had I was simply just taking raw pieces of tissue and throwing them in a in a ziploc and sending them off and I was getting some cross contamination from uh, these samples and and I was still getting what I considered to be pretty good diagnostics but I was getting other crap in there that I I didn't need and I didn't need to pay them to to find so there was that right. Um, so have these uh, culture swabs. You can you can uh, find them, you know, at various um, various stores. You know, like a, a PBS Animal Health or an MWI or you know you 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 pick your you pick your supply store. But they'll have them. Um, it's it's uh, one of the, one of the labs that we work with, uh, Newport Labs in uh, Minnesota. They have um, a kit that they'll they'll send you. It's a, a prepaid prepaid kit. Uh, it's got a shipping label already addressed back to them, FedEx um, Express, and it's like fifteen or twenty bucks for a flat rate fee. You can ask them to include a couple culture swabs in there, and um, they also have uh, mycoplasma specific swabs. Now I've done. Uh, uh, two short videos on those. They're on the homepage at the Servit Solutions website. So just punch in servitsolutions.com right there on the homepage. There's uh, a couple different videos. And we just do a quick overview of the difference between the culture swabs and the myco swabs, how to use them, etc. So having those prepared um, is ready to go. You need some latex gloves and you need some fresh scalpels. That's pretty much it. Um, so we're ready to get to the phones. Finally, I hope. Bear with me in here. Get a get a drink before I start yapping again. Okay, so we're patiently or not so patiently expecting phones, and um, this will happen sometime in in May. Checking does does are starting to bag up. They're starting to pace. They're doing their thing, um, and we see. We see a doe um, isolate, and she has her fawns. She's having fawns. They're they're literally coming out, and you're like, all right, first fawns of the year, cool. Um, you know, if you've never watched that particular doe uh, fawn or been around her, give her some space. Um, don't jump her. Don't get her up. It's that that whole uh, the whole process is really important, and it's even more important with the younger ones. So if it's a year and a half old. And she's having some fawns. Don't mess with her. Just back it up and chill out. Um, 
this is where a good set of binoculars comes in and you spend as much money as you you can afford and buy a really good pair of binoculars because boy that's a, a handy tool uh, on a deer farm you can identify many many problems with those um plus you know if you're going to take them out in the field and go hunting or something like that it's nice to have a nice setup of uh binoculars so um those does typically a couple hours they got both fawns out they're cleaned up everything's good okay so let's just assume everything goes fine those does need to nurse and they'll lay with those fawns and maybe move a little bit um, six hours six hours those moms when they're done with those fawns will walk away and they will place those fawns down now those fawns may follow but like once their bellies are full um, mom will bet them down and she'll she'll just go stretch her legs get a drink eat because they're that's all they do that's all they do in the spring is eat uh, maybe not so much grain but for sure she'll be on the grass um and she'll just she'll chill out because she just went through an ordeal so this is a good opportunity to handle those fawns what we do and this is really again this is because of all the things we've done before we'll go in we'll do a quick physical examination and, and what does that look like run our hands over them you know I, I, I'm fortunate I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times um, you just you just know when you pick them up like give them a quick check they they look good or they don't so but if you if you haven't done it a bunch um, you know make sure all the parts are in the right places um, certainly do a sex check so lift up the tail two holes girl one hole boy make sure you figure that out right up front um, and then you got a navel to look at so where the umbilical cord was you check out each of the hoofs and the mouth everything else is pretty standard um, these these fawns will um, feel bony but they'll have a you know a, a lively spark to them um, so if there are issues you can address those and it, it's just going to depend on what those are but for the most part the overwhelming majority of these fawns they come out perfect we are the ones that mess them up they come out perfect so just keep that in mind all that work we've done beforehand vaccinating mom spacing them out doing all these these um these other things you know that's a that's where all the hard work is so these fawns are going to come out they're going to drink from mom and that's the key they have to drink that that colostrum is like supercharged right it's got all the all the antibodies from the immune system and all those um immunoglobins and proteins and just all the good stuff that those fawns need is in that colostrum and if you give them time those moms they make good colostrum those fawns are going to drink it up they're going to do really well so um, when you pick them up you're going to feel their belly you know because you kind of scoop them underneath in between their their front legs and their back legs you're going to feel that that belly it's going to be full if it's not full then you need to address that but for the most part it's going to be full we do that health check again hoofs mouth umbilical cord that's it um the only the only thing that we may do really depends on the weather but you know we may spray the belly buttons with some iodine that's it a lot of guys they'll spray hoofs you know because sometimes the the hoofs are soft you'll see them they'll come out and the the section closest to the leg will be brown or black and then they'll have these white tips on it like a soft part of a fingernail um and you know s s some guys just they want to spray those there's nothing wrong with that um if you spray those fawns you know mom's going to come and clean it up but um, that's fine 
we give half a tube of CNE fawn paste and we walk away. People are like, what, 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 what? What do you mean, that's it? Yeah, that's it. Those fawns don't need anything else from us. We can add things if we think that those animals need help. If you're in a selenium deficient area, those fawns may need bosey. Okay, we can add that. If those fawns are, are weak or you're having some extreme weather, maybe those fawns need some vitamin B, a little pickup. Okay, you can do that, but they don't need vaccine when they're born. Can you do it? In some situations, I guess we could we could have that conversation to see if, if that would be warranted. But again, all the hard work went into mom. Mom is primed. She's in her she's in her top condition. Everything that's good in her should be good in those fawns. So that's important. So we give the fawn paste. Um, if you like, you can do um, you can do your your DNA sampling if you're going to do that. Um, the All Flex uh, ear punch with the little uh, vial for um, for sampling. You know, it punches the punches the ear, and then the the little tissue sample falls into the the alcohol vial. Those are real slick. They work awesome. Um, and then if you're if you're tagging fawns, you can put your you can put your ear tag in. Then um, for us, we're not we're not tagging bucks. Uh, we'll microchip them, um, but we're you know we're just we're tagging the does we're gonna keep, and we just there's not a lot of deer in those pens. So you know if we're if we're tagging them, um, it's because there's gonna be other fawns coming. Uh, and we can see that in those does, but there's just not a lot of deer in those pens, so we can we can manage it a little differently. I don't like punching holes in them as much um, because I I've seen where you know bacteria can get into them. Every time you stick them, it kind of opens up their their uh, you know their dermis layer to bad stuff. And guess what? You know once you've had deer on your property a long time, regardless of what you do, there's bad stuff there. So that's something to consider. Um, so that's day one, um, pretty, pretty, pretty basic. Even though I just talked about it for probably too long. Um, day two, we go out, check those fawns, and we give them the other half of tube of the C and E fawn paste. And again, we've we've um, experimented with some some other fawn paste, and and there's some some okay fawn paste on the market. We feel that the CNE product is the the, the best out there. Um, it's worth every penny, and we like supporting uh, Sadie over there at CNE. So uh, give her give her a call. Get some fawn paste. You know, you can buy them by the tube, or you come in cases of twenty five, but have that stuff on hand. Order a couple extra ones. You'll use it. It's just dynamite stuff. Um, and and there's other really good products that they have as well you know like the phone energy pack and stuff like that so just chat with her she'll 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 talk it up with you um so that's day two and then we'll, we'll check those fawns um every day at least once a day mostly twice so once in the morning once in the evenings um just to make sure everybody's good so people say well what kind of stuff are you looking for to know if they're good well, those fawns will sit tight till, let's just say, seven to ten days old, depending on the fawn, depending on the mom, kind of their demeanor, your environment, etc. They may stay put till closer to two weeks, but you get close to them within a couple feet, they're bolting. So that first seven days or so, we're just making sure they're hiding. You see fawns walking around that are young, bleating and stuff. That's not that's not what you want. Those fawns need to be hiding. There shouldn't you shouldn't see any fawns. Like they should be tucked up in your in your tall grass and stuff. And we've we've talked about those those management techniques uh, before, and we can we can cover those again, but not here. Um, so that's what I'm looking for. If a fawn does get up and run, that's fine. 
I'm, I'm immediately going to have my, you know, I got my, my binoculars on my chest. I'm putting those up and I'm, I'm staring at that fawn mm -hmm. as it runs away. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for a slick looking animal. No like roughed up hair or anything. I mean, maybe it just poured and they're drying up and they get a little, you know, a little, a little fuzzy or something, but I'm looking for, I'm looking for slick coat animals the overwhelming majority of the problems that we find in fawns that we've seen in the first two weeks of life are digestive. That's it. And the number one killer of a fawn is dehydration, which is usually caused by diarrhea. So we're looking at E. coli, Clostridia, Coccidia after, you know, 12 to 14 days old, Salmonella, Giardia, Cryptosporidium. Those are a little smaller issues but everybody's going to have a little bit different of a problem but e coli that's a big one um and that's where the diagnostic stuff comes into play and that's why it's really important to have that um have those diagnostic coolers ready to roll because if one animal gets it most likely there's going to be more so when we're looking at e coli how is e coli um how does it get in the body? Fecal oral transmission. Those fawns are eating poop and they're getting sick. So when we're looking, when that fawn jumps up and we're looking at them, we're looking at the back um, hawk area on the inside, the tarsal gland and the area around the butt and the tail so you know as you've seen when fawns drink mom cleans them up right so she's licking back there and she cleans up every bit of the poop that comes out of them it's, you know for it's a survival mechanism but she keeps it clean if an animal has diarrhea that stuff's going to get all over and she's going to keep licking on that because the stuff's putrid, right? And it gets, you know, it can get, it's loose, so it's getting all over the sides of, of the uh, back white portion of the of the fawn's tail, you know, and, and, and butt when you're looking at it from the rear. So if you see an animal that, like, consistently has, like, a, a really wet-looking rear end, that's a red flag. So that, that animal needs watched. Now, what else happens when an animal has diarrhea? Well, those fawns, you know, they curl up in that long grass area that you keep. And, you know, where they hide and they make their little fawn beds. You can see them when you, when you walk through our grass strips that we, we leave for the fawns to, to lay in. You'll, you'll see that, uh, that little fawn bed. When they jump up, you check out that fawn bed. And if they have diarrhea, there'll be diarrhea right there. Sometimes fresh because they can't, they can't control their bowel movements. Otherwise, they need to be stimulated from their mom to, to go to the bathroom, at least for a little bit. So if you can get some, uh, if you can get some, some stool samples out of there, that's good. You know, get some mucusy stuff or whatever you're dealing with, some just liquid whatever just make sure that's where your latex gloves come in you want to touch that stuff it's nasty latex gloves ziploc bag whoosh, into the fridge until you're ready to send it send it same day make sure that stuff's fresh excuse me fresh and it's stored in a in a fridge so I'll look at the fawns assess the fawns make sure that they're you know they're um they're doing okay so once we hit, well, I guess we'll 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 just we'll continue on from there. Um, those diagnostics of the loose stools, um, that is going to be when you get those results back. Number one, you're gonna you're gonna ask them to check for um, if they're two weeks old or under. You're gonna check for salmonella. Giardia, Cryptosporidium, E. coli, Clostridia. 
that pretty much covers all of them. My guess is you're going to find E. coli. That's it. My guess is you're going to find E. coli. That's just the biggest problem we deal with. So when you find, when they find that E. coli, and again, it could be other stuff. I'm just, this is the overwhelming majority of, of places. When they find that E. coli, you have to tell them beforehand, but have them do a antibiotic susceptibility test, an MIC, a mic test. And what that does is when they when they culture the E. coli bacteria and they, you know, basically whatever, have it in a petri dish, right? They're going